guys, Mr. Backerberg here. We're starting lesson 1.5, taking a look at the graphs of some functions. We've got four objectives for our video. The very first thing we're going to look at doing is finding the domain and range of a function graphically. Two, we're going to look at using the vertical line test to see if something is a function. Three, we're going to look at finding the zeros of a function. Now we're actually going to do that algebraically first, and then I'm going to show you how to check your answers graphically using your calculators. And then number four, we're going to look at things called increasing, decreasing, and constant intervals of a graph. So let's say we were taking a look at this graph. This is no specific function. I just kind of drew it out for example purposes. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this graph and figure out what the domain of our function is. Now thinking back to some work we did earlier, domain is related to the x values that are safe to plug into the function. Okay? Same thing is going to happen graphically. We're still going to look at those x values. But we need a way to describe what they look like or describe where they are. So I'm actually going to represent this two different ways. I'm going to use something called interval notation as one way to describe it. And then I'm also going to write it out as an inequality. Quick little side note on inequalities and interval notation using this number line graph to help me out. Uh, if we wanted to take and represent this graph on our number line as an inequality, we'd have to look at the endpoints. Okay, so our graph starts at negative 2 and it ends at 4. So we're thinking about a way to represent the values between here. So I'm going to use an x to represent uh, that variable. So as far as this end point at negative 2, okay, this is a solid filled in dot, meaning that this value is included, and then we're going to the right, so the number's greater than negative 2. So the way we would represent that on our inequality, uh, open end towards the x, since we're heading towards values bigger than negative 2, but also include that equals 2 because we've got a filled in circle there, that value is included. If we wanted to talk about this right-hand endpoint at 4, we're dealing with values that are smaller than 4, okay, so less than 4. So here's how we would represent this graph as an inequality. Okay, it's x values that are between negative 2, okay, included, and 4, not included. The way we would write this out as an interval, using interval notation, we use square brackets to represent included values and just regular parentheses for values that are not included. So as far as this negative two endpoint goes, that value is included. So we would open up our interval with a square bracket because it's included, and we just use the negative two. And we write it almost like an ordered pair going up through four, but four is not included because of the open circle, so that one gets an open parentheses. So going back to our graph, talking about the domain, uh, I'm going to start with interval notation because I just personally like that form better. I think it's easier to look at than writing things out as an inequality. Domain is dealing with the x values, so I first want to look at the smallest x value that shows up on our graph, starting on the far left. Well, we've got this endpoint here at negative 1. Negative 1 has a filled in dot there, meaning that it is included, so that one gets a square bracket around it. Going off to the right, looking at the biggest x value that shows up on our graph. Looks like it happens right here at 5, but that one has an open circle, meaning it's not included, so that one gets a plain parentheses around it. Now taking this and translating it into an inequality. Okay, We started at negative 1, included, so that's going to be with an equals 2, uh, with that x value, since we're talking x values in the domain, uh, then we're less than our 5, not included because we've got the parentheses there and the open circle. Okay, so there's two different ways to represent the domain. Like I said, I personally prefer the interval notation. I just think it's easier to look at than this kind of complicated inequality. Shifting gears a little bit, next thing I want to look at is the range of this function. Remember, range is related to the y value answers that we get back when we start plugging x values into our graph. Again, I'm going to write this out using interval notation and as an inequality, uh, just so you guys can see both forms. So we're looking at y values. So first thing we're going to look for is the smallest y value that shows up on our graph. So we're looking for the lowest point on our graph. Looks like it happens right here at negative 3. OK, 
Okay, that one has a filled in dot, meaning that that value is included. So that one gets a square bracket around it. Then we look for the highest y value, the biggest y value that shows up on our graph. Uh, looks like that happens up here at positive three. Again, filled in dot, so that means that one is also included. So there's our interval. If we were to take this and write it out as an inequality, we'd start at negative three, uh, less than or equal to since it is included. Here we're dealing with range, so y values, and then our other endpoint is three, again with that inclusion that equals to piece. One last thing we're gonna do with our graph is taking a look at pulling some information out from it. So we're looking at finding a couple of function values. We're looking at f of negative one and f of two. Now remember this f of, when we used our function notation, uh, really this f of stuff just replaced our y value. So if we're looking at f of negative one, it means we're looking at the y value at an x value of negative one. Remember the stuff inside the parentheses represents our x value. So let's look at our x value of negative one. Well, the y value there is one. So we'd say that f of negative one is one. If we look at f of two, again, this says find the y value when our x value is two. So we go to two, look on our graph, the y value is negative three. Next thing we're taking a look at is something called our vertical line test for functions. So I've got kind of the description up there. It says a set of points in a coordinate plane is the graph of y as a function of x if and only if no vertical line intersects that graph at more than one point. And really what this relates to is the fact that when we're dealing with functions, we said that each x value can have one and only one y value. So three graphs we're gonna take a look at and I'm gonna show you how the vertical line test works. Uh, so let me grab my straight line tool here, make it a little bit easier on myself. I'm gonna start with this graph on the left hand side. Okay, the way the vertical line test works is you draw a vertical line through the graph. If it intersects at more than one point, the graph is not a function. Okay, so this vertical line that I just drew in intersects our graph at two different points. Okay, it intersects right here and it also intersects right here. So that x value has two different corresponding y values, means this one is not a function. If we look at our second graph, okay, we can draw in a vertical line. Looks like that one only intersects at one point. Okay, another one, that one only intersects at one point. Another one, that one only intersects at one point. You guys kind of get the idea. Uh, any vertical line we draw on this graph is only gonna intersect at one point. So yes, this one is a function. Next one, uh, I'm gonna start drawing some vertical lines in there. So there we've got one intersection point, one intersection point, one intersection point. But that last line, we don't have any intersection points. Well, the vertical line test says we cannot intersect that more than one point. Okay, it doesn't say anything about less than one point. So yes, this one is a function. Next topic, finding the zeros of a function. Our little description here says the zeros of a function f of x are the x values for which f of x equals zero. Okay, so what that means is when we're finding the zeros of a function algebraically, we're just gonna take whatever our function is, set it equal to zero, and then solve for x. So looking at this example down below, we've got f of x is equal to three x squared plus x minus 10. So in order to find the zeros, we're just gonna replace this f of x on the left-hand side with a zero. So zero equals three x squared plus x minus 10. And now we're thinking solving. So any of those solving strategies that you've learned in the past uh, apply here. You can use those here. This one's quadratic, so you could choose to go with the quadratic formula. Uh, I happen to know that this one factors out. In order to get the three x squared, we're gonna need a three x and a plain x doing a little guess and check with this negative 10 on the end and this plus x in the middle. I know it's gotta be a minus five and a plus two. Okay, now solving, once we have our equation, our function factored out, just take each factor, set it equal to zero. So three x minus five equals zero and x plus two equals zero. 
I'm going to finish the 1 on the right hand side because all we have to do is subtract the 2 over to get x equals negative 2. With this 1 on the left, 3x minus 5 equals 0. We would add the 5 over and then divide by the 3 to get x equals 5 thirds. Okay, so that's algebraically finding the zeros. I am also going to show you how to graphically find the zeros using your calculator. So we're just going to go into the y equals screen. Uh, I already typed in the function y equals 3x squared plus x minus 10. I'm going to go ahead and graph that out. It gives us this picture. And now what we want to do in order to find the zeros, well right above your trace button it says calc. So I'm going to go second trace to get into that calculate menu. Second thing on the list is zero. We're finding zeros. So I'm going to choose that one. Now we can see there are two zeros, uh, two intersection points, two x-intercepts. Uh, so we are going to find both of them. Now when you hit that second calc and pick the zero, it asks you for a left bound point. So what that means is we want to point to the left of the zero we're trying to find. So I'm focusing in on this zero right here. So I'm going to arrow over somewhere to the left of there. Hit enter. You can't really see it right now, but it puts a little arrow up there, meaning that we're looking uh, to the right of that arrow. Now we're looking for a right bound point, so a right end point. So we arrow over past that x-intercept, hit enter again. There that arrow's a little bit easier to see. So it's going to look between those two arrows for an x-intercept. It lets you take a guess, but you don't have to. Just hit enter again, and it'll spit out a value for you. It says your zero is at x equals negative 2. If we want to find the other one, okay, just do the same thing. Go second trace again, pick that zero, uh, a left bound point. I'm already to the left of this intersection point, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit enter, arrow over to the right past that intersection point. There I'm to the right of that x intercept. Hit enter, there you can see our arrows. It's going to look for an x intercept between those two arrows, so hopefully that one right there. Hit enter again, so we've got a zero at x equals 1.666667, um, approximately 5 thirds. Next example, you can pause the video here and try this one out on your own, or just follow along with me. We've got g of x equals the square root of 10 minus x squared. We're finding the zero, so just like we did before, we're going to go zero equals the square root of 10 minus x squared. Uh, now we're trying to get x all by itself. Right now it's trapped underneath this square root. So why don't we go ahead and square both sides? Well, zero squared is zero. If we square a square root, that just kind of cancels itself out. So we're left with 10 minus x squared. Add the x squared over. So we get x squared equals 10. And now we're going to get rid of that squared on our x by taking the square root of both sides. So we get x equals plus or minus the square root of 10. You guys can graph that one out to check the answers if you'd like to. Again, pause the video and try it, or just follow along. 0 equals 2t minus 3 over t plus 5. Now this fraction look on the right-hand side is kind of messy, so I'm going to multiply by t plus 5 in order to get that to cancel out. So we'll multiply by... Uh, t plus 5 again over here. Uh, well, 0 times that is just 0 equals, those cancel, 2t minus 3. Um, add the 3 over. 3 equals 2t, divide by 2, and we get t equals 3 halves. Again, you guys can graph that one out to check your answer. Very last topic for this video, we are talking about pieces of graphs and whether they are increasing, decreasing, or staying constant. Uh, so the notation might be a little bit confusing, so I'm just going to describe what it means. It says our graph is increasing if, as we move from left to right, going along those x values, our graph is increasing if the y values, if the function values, are going up. Okay. Increasing means our graph is going up as we work left to right. Okay. We would say our graph is decreasing, again, as we move from left to right, if our y values, if these function values, are going down, okay, getting smaller. And then our graph is constant 
if those y values are exactly the same, if there's like a flat portion of our graph. So we're gonna look at a few different graphs. I'm gonna use this little stick figure to kind of help me describe how we figure out what our intervals look like. Uh, we are gonna write these things out sort of like interval notation. So looking at this first graph, we're trying to describe its behavior, whether it's increasing, decreasing, or constant. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is take this little guy and just drag him along the graph and kind of figure out what's happening as we work our way from left to right, again, uh, reading these x values left to right, just like you would read a sentence. Uh, this guy looks like he is going uphill the entire time. Well, when we talked about it on the last slide, going uphill meant that our graph was increasing. So now we just have to figure out the interval for which that's happening. Well, if we look at this little arrow down here on the bottom left, it means that these that this graph keeps going. Okay? It goes out towards negative infinity. When we write our intervals, we use the x values that show up on the graph. So if it's going out towards negative infinity, that's kind of the smallest x value for which this graph is increasing. Now this one, it was going up the whole time. If we drag this stick figure back here, our graph is always going up. So we're gonna follow this graph out towards positive infinity, and we're gonna call this an increasing interval because the graph was going up the entire time. Again, using these x values to write our interval. If we take a look at this graph, again, using the stick figure to help us out, uh, our first interval, we can see that there's a couple different things happening here. So if we open up this first interval, we're gonna start at negative infinity, just like we did on the last page, dragging this stick figure along our graph. Okay, it's going up until we hit this point kind of at the top of this hill. So our graph stops increasing right there at the x value of negative one. So this first interval going from negative infinity to negative one is an increasing interval because our little stick figure was going up the hill. Well then there's a little bit of a change if we grab this stick figure. Now we're going down the hill. Since there was a change at negative one, that's where I'm gonna write my next intervals beginning, okay? This one ended at negative one, so our next one should open at negative one. And again, we're just gonna go until something else happens in our graph. So we're going down the hill until we hit this value of positive one. So from negative one to positive one, we were going down the hill. So that was a decreasing interval. That last interval ended at one, so that's where we're gonna start our next interval. And if we grab our little stick figure again from one, we're going up and we can't see anything else happening. So we're just gonna assume that as we work our way out towards positive infinity, our graph keeps going up. So from one to positive infinity, we're gonna call that one increasing. Last one. Same type of thing, you guys can pause the video, try this one out on your own. Uh, we start out going up the hill, so our first interval opens at negative infinity. Uh, we stop increasing, we stop going up the hill at an x value of zero right here at this point. So from negative infinity to zero, our graph is increasing. Then it looks like we've got a flat portion of our graph. If we drag our guy across the graph, from zero, since that last interval stopped at zero, we're gonna open our next one at zero until we hit this x value of two. That one is a constant interval since the graph is flat. That interval ended at two, so we're gonna open the next one at two. And if we keep working out towards the right, looks like this graph is going down the entire time. So from two out until positive infinity, we would say this graph is decreasing. That is it for this video. Please remember to fill out the Google form, which as always is linked in the description down below. And thanks for watching.